Good morning. I invite you to follow with me the gospel reading today in your bulletin from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 3 to 17. This is John, who we know as John the Baptist. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other extortions, he proclaimed good news to the people. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be with you, and thank you for the, the warm welcome I received. I want to say I'm excited for you as you begin this joining of households with First Presbyterian Church. We've joked in DeKalb that our Prairie Association office that First Pres is coming to join Second Congregational and that you'll bank at Fifth Third. So we do talk about you. It's nice to join colleagues Fred and Mike and... Dean up in the balcony and Janet Schlater to be with you in worship today. And I also want to take a moment to thank you for your ongoing generous support of our church's wider mission, OCWM. It's your giving that makes possible everything from support for some of our overseas missionaries, copy paper in the office, gas for me to get between churches, and time to be with churches in transition, providing resources to churches, occasionally checking for legal help when there are mergers and disunions and all the good things that happen in our churches. So I thank you very, very much for your continued generosity. I also want to say thank you to the bell choir. That was just lovely, wonderful, wonderful music today. You know, it's funny, when I was asked to come up with a sermon title and choose a scripture for Sunday, a week ago, in thinking about today, I was going to do something a little different. So the Hallmark Holiday title made sense at the time, and after Friday, it didn't make a lot of sense. And so as I came into church today and drove around the corner and saw the title, out on the signboard out front, I had that twinge that, you know, if I could have changed that 48 hours ago, I would have. Pastor Mike also told me about the death of Jeremy, the young man from your congregation whose funeral was here yesterday. 
and I am so sorry for you as a church family and for his own family. I know Mike is going to speak about the shootings in Connecticut later in our service, but it's hard to look for the good news today without addressing what happened in Connecticut. The whys run through our heads, our minds, over and over again. When President Obama was addressing the nation on Friday afternoon, he said that we as a nation have experienced this too much. And whether it's in Newtown, Connecticut, or Aurora, Colorado, or even closer to home at Northern Illinois University, these shootings, this senseless death, stops us right in our tracks. And I'm reminded of the awful news on September 11th, 2001, when it was so important to come together as a congregation, to gather with others, and though we didn't have answers, we needed to be together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as people looking to make sense of a senseless tragedy, as people who believe deeply in God and in the transformative power of Jesus Christ. It was so important that morning to come together. And just like in Newtown, Connecticut, we hastily put up signboards out in front of the congregation, in front of our churches, that we were going to worship together that night, that there would be a prayer vigil or a prayer service. And we looked for the right words, and we came together simply to hold hands and to pray. My sister's pastor sent out a prayer for the families of Newtown, Connecticut to their little congregation in Sycamore. And my sister forwarded that to me last night, and she said the line that struck her in, the, in her pastor's prayer is, that we turn to prayer, not as a last resort, but as a first option. So often I hear people say, I'm going to pray for you and I wish I could do more. And yes, we do wish we could do more. Something tangible always makes us feel better about ourselves. But coming to God in prayer at this time allows us to join hearts with God, with the one who came to Bethlehem to, as Mike said in his children's message, to be one of us. I was moved to tears hearing on the radio the young father named Robbie Parker, whose daughter Emily was killed, and maybe you've heard this story, but he makes a statement of faith that he is choosing not to hate, not to hate child of God who took the life of his own daughter. He says that it's Christ-like. Not, he's, he's not talking about forgiveness because it's far too raw and far too soon, but he's, I believe, reminding us of Jesus on the cross in the midst of his own agony, asking God to forgive those around him, saying that they know not what they do. Random violence isn't necessarily what John the Baptist was addressing when he spoke so long ago. I read a sermon years ago that said that on this Sunday, when we hear John the Baptist chastising those who have come out to hear them, calling them a brood of vipers, you know, a, a snake pit of people, and this pastor quipped, you know, we never see John the Baptist's holiday cards. Advent does, uh, Hallmark does not have an Advent line of cards, does he? This is a time when our culture says over and over and over, we're to be happy, 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 as if buying more and being in Walgreens or Carson's or Kohl's is with all this stuff around us is going to change who we are. And yet our, our liturgy this morning, our lighting of the Advent candle, it's the candle of joy. And it's a reminder of the joy that is ours in Jesus. But our joy is mitigated by random violence, by our sense that things seem to be out of control. John the Baptist is such a downer. 
such a downer. And it's hard to tell if he's truly a holy man, if he's the Messiah, or if he's just some nutcase walking through the desert. But there's something in his words, in his message, that rings true then, and it rings true now, and people come out to see him, to hear him. Some may come for the entertainment value of this man who wears a thong and eats, eats locusts for lunch, and some may come simply because he's an oddity and there's no on-demand TV then. But some come because they hear the truth ringing in his words and they recognize that reality check that he offers, that there needs to be congruency between the words that we proclaim and the way we live our lives. We have to walk the walk, John is telling us. And his prescription for preparing us for the realm of God still rings true today. We are to prepare our hearts, we're told. We're to walk away from greed. We're to work for the common good without abusing or misusing the authority that we've been given. We're to remember that we are accountable for our deeds, for the power that we have and how we use it. And it's pretty basic stuff, but it's pretty hard to do. There was a reminiscence back at Thanksgiving weekend about JFK, about his speech to the nation that we were going to put someone on the moon, about this competitive streak in response to what the Soviet Union was doing. But nevertheless, he says, we are going to choose to go to the moon in this decade. And we choose to go to the moon and do other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard. And John is asking us to do the things that are hard to be people of integrity, people of faith. And yet, in the midst of this, in the midst of this chastising, in the midst of calling people brood of vipers and, and suggesting that they think that they are better than others because Abraham is their father, in the midst of all this, the last line of our scripture says that with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. And what is that good news? What is the good news on this third Sunday in Advent for Jeremy's parents, for the people of Newtown, Connecticut, for the first responders, for the chaplains, for the school teachers, for the children who lost their lives, and for the children who lost their parents? The good news is that one is coming one has come. The one whose birth we will celebrate on Tuesday was born into a broken world. Herod wanted him dead. Herod sent out his minions to ensure that he die. And the Gospel of Matthew tells us that thousands were slaughtered. Thousands of infants were killed. This is the world into which the Savior was born. This is a world in which we live today. But Christmas points us to Christ, and Christmas points us to God, to the God who shared our lives, who, who knows our disappointments, our discomforts, our anxieties, our fears, and yes, who knows our joy. This is the God who loves us so deeply that he wants to come to us. And this is the God who calls on us to love deeply as well. To join God's heart in prayer when we are broken. To join with those whom we call brothers and sisters in Christ when we have to find a way to be together. The Gospel of John reminds us that that light, the light that was Jesus, shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. Somehow that young father in Newtown, Connecticut, has made a decision not to hate. And we, as people of faith, may respond the same way, to choose not to hate, but to find the good, to join with our brothers and sisters here in this congregation to be a people 
who will seek peace, who will write injustice, who will look for joy in our children, in our parents, in our own hearts. This young father is modeling for us a new way of living in what could be a bitter season. And on this third Sunday in Advent, the candle of joy lit by a beautiful daughter of God and of this congregation reminds us that the joy and the peace and the hope that Jesus the Christ brings are the true gifts from God and the true gifts from Christmas. Let us pray. God of grace and every good, wonderful gift, into our broken world you come as the baby of, of Bethlehem. Allow him to be at the center of our lives, and may this presence infuse us with the joy that only you can bring. Amen.